Now, our Father, as we finish up our prayer time, we commit all these things to you. And, uh, Lord, we pray for tonight as we continue the series that we began so long ago. Pray for your blessing. Pray for your help. Pray, Lord, you teach us and encourage us. Remind us who you are. Remind us of your word and the importance of your word. So we commit our time to you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. All right, you don't have an outline, right? So let me double check, make sure. Okay, good. Well, we've uh, been doing a series on Wednesday nights when we finished. We finished with uh, part two. And we've been doing a series on the reliability of the Bible. And just because as, as a quick reminder and a, as a review, because it's been a little while since we've been together on Wednesday nights, there are three tests used to determine the validity or reliability of any ancient document. The first one is the bibliographic test. This deals with the manuscript evidence of any kind of writing. You know, how many manuscripts are there? How close were they to the original? Um, are they accurate? You know, what are the differences within them? You know, where are they found, et cetera, et cetera. And we did an overview of that and we demonstrated very conclusively the scripture has more manuscripts than every other ancient document combined. And that's just the New Testament, by the way. So there was the bibliographic evidence. And there was the external test. This includes archaeology, external documentation, science, uh, these things to show that the Bible is reliable. And of course, you can go to Jerusalem today, go to Israel today. The Jewish people are still around in existence today. You can find you know, cities and inscriptions and all these things you know, regarding Israel or the kings of Israel or a David or Pontius Pilate or things like that when it comes to archaeology, external documentation. There's you know, writings in ancient history, that you know, Egyptian writings and Assyrian writings that talk about Israel and talk about different things with regards to what Scripture says. So it shows the validity of that and also science. The Bible is not a science textbook, but it does talk about science. It talks about the water cycle in Ecclesiastes. Jonah saw mountains at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, or the Mediterranean sea long before people invented deep sea diving. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, all these things are there. You know, the scripture is very clear and reliable. But now we come to the third test. This is the internal test. The internal test. Now, what is that? That is, is it consistent with itself? You know, if uh, a writing says one thing in one part and something contradictory in another part, well, that, you know, uh-oh, there's something wrong here. You know, you read the Book of Mormon, there's things that just don't fit. It doesn't make sense. One, it's archaeologically not true, because those people never existed. Or giraffes in New York State. Yeah, giraffes in New York State and a whole bunch of other wacky things that just aren't true. And then you look at other writings, too, and they just completely contradict themselves. So that's one thing. Uh, are there you know, internal contradictions? Are there errors? You know, that's another thing, too, that people have to be concerned about when it comes to the internal evidence of a writing. You know, are there problems that cannot be explained? You know, logically or practically or to, to the satisfaction of other people. Although some people are never satisfied, by the way. But that's where we ask, you know, is what is said actually even true? Yeah, so this internal test is still important, but as before, when we look at these evidences of Scripture, we do have to remember that only the Holy Spirit can open up our understanding to believe by faith. So although it's good to learn all these things and to have them as an apologetic or a defense for the faith, we have to remember that one, we can't convince anybody if they don't want to be convinced, and two, they have to believe. So they are responsible to believe or not or held accountable for their unbelief. You know, but faith is not blind either. You know, faith is an evidence and it's not a blind leap into a dark chasm as some have said over the years. And by the way, our faith is only as good as the object in which it is placed. Now you're sitting in those chairs, you have faith that that chair is going to hold you up. Well, if I brought in another chair that had three legs and was ready to fall apart, you may say, well, I've got faith this chair's going to hold me up, and you sit and you fall on the ground. Well, your, your faith was misplaced. <laughs> <It's> stupid. Yeah. 
You know, so our faith is in Jesus, our faith is in God, our faith is in his word. And scripture has been tested down through the ages and is still found to be true and shining every time. Do you realize that Moses wrote about 1450 BC, if you remember? So the book that we're reading is about 3,500 years old, part of it. That's an old book. And we're still studying it and reading it to this day. There has been and there always will be attacks on the Bible. You can think of those in history, you think of the atheists and everything like that, and of course persecution and, and more. And there are many who will say, well, there's internal contradictions in the Bible. And there's a lot of topics or people or places or numbers and this and that and the other. And usually if somebody says that to you, you say, well, just name one for me, please. Because they, they've heard that or they've read that somewhere in some television show or internet program or something like that. Oh, these are contradictions. And, da, 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 da. and they just pick it up on it because they say, oh, okay, good. I don't have to believe that book. Just ask them to name one for you. And we'll, we'll look at some of the alleged ones as we continue this part of the series. This is where professors and scholars and cults, atheists and agnostics will bring charges against the Bible as if they are the judge, jury, and executioner of God's book. But we do have to be honest. There are difficulties at times. There are difficult passages. There are things that seem to be contradictory, or I would call paradoxical, but they can be explained satisfactorily. So let's come to our outline. <clears throat> First of all, the internal test. B, the claims of itself. That's one thing that's looked at whenever a, a book is, is talked about or a writing is talked about. C, we're going to look at some prophecies. Then we'll look at Jesus. And then we'll finish up, is the Bible true? Now, of course, this is going to take us some time. But as we look at, is the Bible reliable? We first come to the internal test. The internal test. So let me ask you, is the Bible consistent within itself? Okay, yes. I have a yes. I have one yes. I have two yeses. I have three. Okay. How do you know? Because you read it? And over. Read it over and over again. That's the best place to start. Comparing scripture with scripture. Comparing scripture with scripture. Reading in context. Reading in context, absolutely. Now, who does the Bible say that it's from? Who is the author? God. Now, if you have a problem with it, go to God. If you have a problem with it, go to God. Exactly. Now, if the Bible is from God, should it be consistent within itself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because if the being of God is inconsistent within himself, then there's a problem. Which is, by, by the way, the case with all other false gods. They're inconsistent with themselves. You know, there should also be some kind of flow to the Bible. Is there a flow to the yes. Bible? Is that what we find? Yes. Okay, well, what is that flow? It's God's redemptive plan for humanity. It's God's redemptive plan Take, well, basically, he has to take back the world first. Mm -hmm. Then humanity is yeah. He didn't have to do that. Yeah, it's God's redemptive plan for creation and yeah. humanity. Taking back what was given away in the garden. Yeah. Which is the beginning and the end. It's the beginning and the end. Genesis and Revelation. And once again, I briefly mentioned some of this. Remember, this was written by over 40 human writers. Over, you know, 1500 year period with different education levels. Peter was a fisherman. Moses and Paul were very educated men. Joshua was a warrior. <laughs> Daniel was a politician and prophet. You know, so we have a lot of different backgrounds and different styles of writing, of course, different education levels, three languages. Remember what those three languages were? Greek. Over on this side. Greek, Greek and Hebrew and begins with an A. Aramaic. Aramaic. Aramaic, yep. Only certain sections, by the way, in the Old Testament were Aramaic. On three continents, also. Again, different styles of writing and different genres in, in, 
it's astounding to see how consistent it is when you actually sit down and look at it. It's amazing. So with this in mind, is there anything else that you want to mention about its consistency? Okay, well, let me give you one example. <clears throat> Let's consider the first and last book, Genesis and Revelation. Genesis is the book of beginnings. Revelation is the book of endings. Go to Revelation 12. I'll actually start at the end and then go back. Revelation 12. And you may have heard me use this example before, but it's pretty easy and pretty simple. Even though a lot of people get it wrong, unfortunately. Genesis 12. Or I'm sorry, Revelation 12. So click there or turn there. We'll look at verses 1 through 6. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and in, in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in the heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. That goes back to Daniel, by the way. We'll look at that right now. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for one hundred and 1,260 days. So, what are the views of this text? What are some of the views you've heard? There's three or four of them. Mary is one, Mary is one of them. Catholicism is rampant with this, particularly with the stars and the glowing head and everything. Okay, so Mary, what else? Some say this is the church. I actually just read that today, in fact. I was like... We were in Bible study where the 12 tribes were actually killed. All right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a common view, too. So we have Mary, we have the church. What other ones have we heard? Well, yes, it is. As you continue reading, you find out the dragon is Satan. And of course, this is a reference to the spiritual battle that's going on. And continues, <laughs> by the way. Well, who else could this woman be? Well, the third option and the correct option is Israel. Israel. Well, how do you know? Well, let's first of all look at our text here. So we have a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, a moon under her feet, her head a crown of 12 stars. Okay. Well, she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. Well, that's Israel historically when you look at it. Well, how else do we know it's Israel? Well, wait a second. Who did this woman give birth to? Verse 5, a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Well, that's Jesus. <laughs> and of course, he was, you know, lived a life, perfect life, died at the cross and physically resurrected, ascended into heaven and will come back again. But in order to understand this text, we have to go back to Genesis. And that's Genesis 37. Genesis 37. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 37. And we're doing this just to show some of the consistency. Now remember, Moses wrote Genesis about 1450 BC. John wrote the Revelation about 95 AD. So you can't really get you know, much further away than that. And the events that Moses wrote about actually happened before him. So we're talking about a few hundred years even before Moses. And here we have a man named Jacob. 
Look at verse 1 of chapter 37 of Genesis. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the, the sons of Bilhah and Zophah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought in a bad report to them to their father. In other words, he tattled on them. Although it probably was true, by the way. Now Israel, who's Israel? Jacob. Jacob. Another name for Jacob. Loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. <laughs> I can relate with that, by the way. And he made him a robe of many colors. Now you probably all heard the Dolly Parton song, you know, the coat of many colors that my mama made for me, but that's a different context. Verse 4, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Verse 5, now Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. This agricultural dream. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and, and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? They perfectly understood what it meant. Or are you indeed to rule over us? Well, yeah, eventually. Or, or they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Look at verse 9. Then he dreamed another dream and told his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Hmm. That sounds kind of familiar, don't it? But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you dream? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow down ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. Well, wait a second. Don't we have a contradiction here, though? We have 11 stars here in Genesis 37. But in... Uh, Revelation 12, 1, we have 12 stars. Why is there 11 and why is there 12? Typology, but also 2. We have to remember that Joseph would be included in the 12 in Revelation 12. So that's where the 12 come from. So we see this parallel very clearly here. This is in Genesis. There's a lot of reference, and as I've said before, you cannot really understand Revelation without a working knowledge of the Old Testament. Because there are those kinds of references, there's over 300 references directly or indirectly to the Old Testament in Revelation. Revelation is the most Old Testament book. Yep. Yep. Along with Hebrews. Yeah. You know, so that's just one example of the consistency within Scripture. So this is a parallel. Again, these books were written about 1,500 years apart. And the time of Joseph was even before Moses. Yet there is this continuity and consistency within itself. Now a human being could not do that. Only God can do that. Only if one person wrote it. They might. Only if one person wrote it, you know, over the period of a year, two years, or however long it would take to write a book of this length. Which is very complicated and complex, by the way. When you sit down and actually look at it with the people and the events and the places, and this person got married to this person, this person had this person, and this person went to this person, but this person was here, and this person was there, and oh, deportation, and oh, okay, the kingdom splits. And it's just mind blowing as to the detail that's in Scripture. Now, it doesn't answer every question, of course. There's some details we wish were in there that are not, but God has given us what He knew we needed. We have a hard enough time figuring this out. Let's not try to figure out something that's not in there, by the way. So we see Scripture is consistent within itself. And there's even a parallel between the judgments in Exodus and the judgments in Revelation. Right. There's parallels there, too. We have creation in Genesis. We have recreation in Revelation. The new heavens and new earth. You know, so let's just look at it. A couple of examples from just two books. They're not looking at everything else. 
So we see that the Bible is consistent within itself. Any other thoughts about this? Any other examples that you may want to think of or give? Three, two, one. Okay, let's go to the next one. So that was A, consistent with itself. Let's go to B. Are there contradictions? No. No? No? No. If you rightly divide the word of truth, there are no contradictions. Right. To keep it in context, if yes. you understand you know, what it's saying and the reason it's saying it, there are no contradictions. No. Again, God cannot contradict himself. Human beings do. Sometimes on a daily basis. We say we want to do one thing, we end up doing something else. <laughs> but there are no contradictions. Now, there are texts that appear contradictory. I'm going to look at one of those here. Matthew 28. Matthew 28. So, go back to the New Testament. Now, there, there are numerous examples that can be given. We're just going to look at, you know, one or two as we go along in this uh, series. Because we can't go through all of them, of course. You know, but this is where higher critics have had to, or tried to have a field day with some of these supposed contradictions. Matthew 28, 1 through 10. So let's read this. Now after the Sabbath, from the dawn of the first day of the week, Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid and go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. So how many angels do we have in this text? It mentions one. It mentions one. One speaking, one moved the tomb, one's talking to them. We only have one. But let's go over to John. John chapter 20. And this is actually one of the examples that are, that's used by critics and skeptics to try to disprove Scripture. John chapter 20. Just two verses. 11 and 12. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting there with the body of Jesus had been laying. One at the head and one at the feet. Uh-oh. We have a contradiction. Matthew says there was only one. Outside the tomb. John says there was two. Inside the tomb. What do we do? We're in trouble. No? There's two and one was speaking. There's two and one was speaking. It's really not that complicated. But again, this is one example that skeptics use, the critics use, that others use. They all look at the contradiction. No, if, if there's two, there's going to be one. <laughs> Maybe one didn't speak. Yeah. Maybe one didn't Maybe say anything. One didn't. Yeah. And it's possible there were three. One outside and two inside. Right. That's possible too. But it's just talking about the one. And that if you want to go with consistency, anytime you see God, Yeah. And 
the reason for this difference, not contradiction, but the difference, is that the writers are just focusing on what they're right. that they want to focus on. Matthew focused on the one angel that moved the, that moved the, uh, the, the, the stone and talked to the ladies. John's focusing on the two angels inside the tomb because his, his purpose is to show that that's the Ark of the Covenant. Right. Because his, his whole gospel is a picture of the tabernacle. So these are four accounts and we can follow four witnesses, I guess. Yeah. If you go to a you go to a crime scene and ask four people what they saw, you know, I saw a guy with right. black coat on and everyone says I saw he had a hat and everyone mm -hmm. says he didn't have a hat, he did his hat was red, he red was maroon. Mm -hmm. I mean, and when it comes to the gospel writers, you know, there will be differences, but there's also similarities because they're talking about different things and different uh, ways of doing it and structured differently, too, for a different purpose. And that's what needs to be understood when it comes to Scripture. There is a purpose for the writing. It's not going to include all the details. Never contradictory details, but complementary details. Complementary details. So Matthew focuses on one. John focuses on two. And... And we'll just go ahead and finish finish with that for now and pick it up again, Lord willing, next time. Because there, there are some textual differences that we need to be aware of. That we talked a little bit about uh, in the bibliographic test. But you guys want to finish up with anything here, whether it's you know, the angels or something else that you've heard about um, that people think is a contradiction that really isn't? Or any questions or thoughts before we finish up? So John was at the tomb. John was at the tomb. Right. He wasn't at the tomb. Right. He wasn't at the tomb. So, Matthew only knew what somebody told him or mm -hmm. what he found or who knows what he did. Well, and, and, this, and the ladies were actually there before John was there. Right. Right. Because yeah, they, they ran back and they told them. <laughs> right. And then Peter and John ran and said, Whoa. Right. The ladies are sitting there. <clears throat> it's the Ark of Heaven. Right. Yeah. Same thing. Any final thoughts or questions before we finish up tonight? I mean, when I was doing this Bible study, we had a discussion here and there in five from my little head and stuff. It's 30 years ago. Um, most everything that I remember we ever had an issue on was thanks to the Ark of mm -hmm. And yeah. where it all came down yep. to. Yep. I mean, it, it, and that's the part of the thought. And, mm -hmm. and like I said, salvation is about idea. Yes. Not. Yeah. And that's why context is so important. Because when you keep it in context, it fits together. Now, sometimes it may not fit the way we want it, the way we think, but it does fit together. And, and you know what? One of the things that the Bible kind of pointed out to me that I remember in the early days was you got to keep everything in context. Mm -hmm. and, and, and my father was military, and it was all, always you had to do everything in context mm -hmm. and things that happened, which drives me crazy. That's just, yep. it's just mind numbing to me, the yep. lack of thought. Mm -hmm. And lack of discernment on the people who listen. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yep. Most people just, they do. Yep. yep. That's true. It's personal. So. Yeah. Anything else? Any final thoughts or anything? Right. Okay. Like Kevin said, she always contact. You have to who was Paul. Yep. Who were they talking mm -hmm. to? When was it written? Mm -hmm. Why was it Why written? Why was it written? And then keep it in the historical written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of as, a, as an application and a final challenge, I guess, for us, um, let us try to live lives that are also consistent and not contradictory. No, we're not going to be perfect in this life. You understand? We're going we're gonna to blow it. And God's grace is more than sufficient. But let us do our best to be consistent with what Scripture says and not to be contradictory with our own words and with our own lives. Let's go ahead and finish up. Again, our Father and God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and your goodness. And Lord, I do pray for us that we would live a life that is, first of all, pleasing to you and honoring to you, uh, consistent with what your word says, and help us not to be a, a walking contradiction, but to be consistent. Lord. Lord, we can't do that on our own. We need your help. And we thank you that your word is consistent and not contradictory. And of course, we lift up all the requests that we had earlier, all the prayer requests and the praises and, and thank you for those things and just pray for the people and the situations and everything going on. Lord. We commit our time to you. We thank you. We love you. We praise you. 
And I look forward to gathering together again uh, this coming Sunday uh, to worship you in uh, spirit and in truth. So, Father, we commit our time to you. Keep us safe as we uh, go back to our homes tonight. And may we rejoice in you and rejoice because you are faithful, because you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good night. Yeah.